2 Corinthians chapter 11. We're going to uh, pick up where we've been for the last couple of weeks. And that is that how holiness will always precede power. And the Lord never intended for his church to be powerless. Rather, he intended for the devil to be powerless and the church to be powerful. That's right. That's right. And I like powerful because we're full of power. Because we're full of the Holy Spirit. We're full of the Word. We're full of Christ. Amen? Amen. And if he is in you, then everything that he is, is in you as well, right? Yes. Amen. So... But the very thing that we need to come to a place of realization is, is one of the things that has stopped the power of God in the church is that we have taken on the things of the world rather than uh, being an example to the world and not being a part of what the world is. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. And we need to come back to a place of being what God called the church to be. And as we discovered out of Matthew 21, that when Jesus surveyed the temple, the first thing that he did was he cleaned it out before he released power and authority in the temple. And that's the very same thing that he is doing in us even right now. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, <clears throat> kind of talked a little bit about this last week. Beginning verse 1 and 2 is where we're going to be. Paul says, I would to God that you could bear with me a little in my folly, and indeed bear with me. For I'm jealous over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused or joined you to one husband. How many? One. How many? One. Okay. That I may present you as a chaste or a pure virgin to Christ. When he says espouse you to one husband, those, those people that have been married and divorced or whatever, don't think that he's dealing with you and kicking you out of that equation. He's not. He's talking about that there's only room in your life for one God. And that's all there is. <clears throat> one. You can't have a multiplicity. There's only place for one God. Jesus is Lord. God is the Father and the Holy Spirit to dwell within you. That's what we have been joined to is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay? So he's saying there's no room for any other gods or idols within your life. Only espoused you to one, and that is the Heavenly Father. Amen? You follow that? Okay. So we find that throughout Scripture, there's many different places that the church is referred to as a virgin. Okay, and a lot of times when people think about a virgin, they think about just somebody who is free from premarital sex or extracurricular activity concerning sexual activity. Uh, but really what he's dealing with here is somebody who has lived a life that is pure. Someone who has been set apart for another. Everybody say set apart for another. Okay. And to be held... For the one they are promised to. Okay? So I'm not condoning premarital sex. I'm not condoning all that other stuff. But I'm telling you what he's referring to as a virgin in this particular case. Is that someone who is held for one particular individual. And kept from all others. Okay? So as the church we're only to be held by him. And held for him. You follow that? Okay? And as you can read like Matthew chapter 25, we talk about the, they talk about the ten virgins at the end of the age that remember that five were prepared and five weren't prepared. So there is a preparedness that the church needs to be in in order to be received, excuse me, to be received of him. And we even find that in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. It says, that the marriage supper of the Lamb has come, and the bride has made herself 
ready. So a lot of times we think that, well, God is making me ready. God's not making me ready. He already did what he was going to do when Jesus went to the cross and he shed his blood for you and you received him as your Lord and Savior. The blood of Jesus Christ has already uh, cleansed you and made you acceptable in the sight of God. Amen? But from the time that you receive Christ to the time that you go home, many things come across our life and many times we are tempted and given place to those temptations and we're not making ourselves ready before the Lord. The Lord wants our hearts pure. Remember, it's purity of heart and the purity of heart will show itself in purity of action. And when I talk about holiness and I talk about purity, I'm not talking about man-made traditions. I mean, you understand that over the years, men have made traditions and men have made ceremonies out of purity. In other words, what you wear, what you look like, ladies, no makeup. You have to have your blouse up to here and your dress down to here. And you can't wear rings. You can't wear jewelry. And they call that a sense of holiness. That has nothing to do with holiness at all. Holiness has everything to do with what is happening in your heart. Yes. Amen? Yes. And what's happening in your heart always comes out in a place of action. What you do with your life. It's always displayed out there. So true Christianity in the church can never originate from itself. It has to originate only from faith in Christ. Remember the scripture says in Romans 4, it says that righteousness which is by faith. Your righteousness came by faith in Christ Jesus. Your righteousness came when you received Christ as your Savior and your Lord. There's the origination of your righteousness. It had nothing to do with anything else except your faith in Him. Amen? You following that? And then we found last week there in Matthew chapter 1 and verse 23. So just a portion of that scripture says this. For the, for the virgin shall be with child. Now we know that it's referring to Mary birthing our Savior Jesus. But there is, there's something there that you have got to pick up concerning spiritual things. Okay? The virgin shall be with child. Mary is a good picture. Mary is a human being who God used, anointed to carry in her womb our Lord and Savior. I mean, you understand that she needed a Savior just like we do. As a matter of fact, John says that she rejoiced in the Lord her Savior. So we know she needed Savior too. Okay? She, she is no different than anybody else. She just had that particular calling. Okay? You follow that? But she is also a good picture of what we as believers should be. Because we know that, according to the scripture, that married life could symbolize the qualities that the church needs to carry. Okay? She was humble. She considered herself a servant of the Lord. And she took his word literally. Nevertheless, I don't understand how all this is going to come to pass, she said. But nevertheless, at your word, I submit. I mean, you know, we could take a good lesson from that. At the word of the Lord, she submitted to that. Okay? She submitted to his will. And she was set apart for another. You think about that. She strictly was set apart. She was kept for the promised one. So you look at that, and you look at it, a good picture of how we are supposed to be. Okay? And it's the same thing with us. In our spiritual virginity, we need to be set apart for him. And when we do, the body, which is the church, will make way for the giving birth to the ministry of God's Son. Mm. Mm. Did you grab a hold of that? If you get a picture of that, it is powerful. Yes. And that's why I say that statement 
where, it's, where it says that the virgin shall be with child or give birth. The virgin church, it, when it lives that way, will give birth to the ministry of God's Son. And that's exactly what we're supposed to be doing, isn't it? We're supposed to be giving birth to the ministry of Jesus Christ in the earth. Where people will be healed and delivered and set free. People will be saved. Chains will come off of people's lives. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. The lame will walk. People will be baptized in the Holy Spirit. It will be a powerful moving of the Spirit of the living God. Amen. But the church has to be prepared in order for that to take place. And I believe that this is exactly the time period that we're living in. That we're living in a period where God is preparing His church. He's waking it up and saying it's time to come back to the basics of the word. Come back to worship. Come back to purity. And stop embracing the world. But let the world embrace what the church is doing. Amen. Amen? Amen. So as we are preparing and as we are coming to the place where things are going to happen... Let's look at Jesus. How many of you understand Jesus is our great example? That's right. How many of you understand that Jesus took time in preparation before he was released in ministry? I know that's kind of crazy. Hard for us to understand. How can he, being the son of God, how could he have to go through a time of preparation? Well, the scripture says that he did. 30 years, as a matter of fact. He was in preparation for 30 years before he was released in anointed ministry. I know it kind of, with your natural thinking, it's hard to understand that. But it's true. I mean, if you understand that Jesus was always the Son of God. It's not like he all of a sudden came on the scene and was the Son of God after 30 years. No, Jesus was born as the Son of God. Okay? But he was being prepared. Remember in his preparation, the scripture says in Luke chapter 2, and verse 52, it says that yet he increased in wisdom, stature, and favor, get this, with God and man. <laughs> that's hard for you in your natural mind to grab a hold of, but nevertheless, that's what the word says, so that must be absolutely true, right? Yes. Okay? So, preparation. He was always sinless. He was always obedient, yet Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 8 and 9 says this, is that have, uh, he, was, oh, he learned obedience from the things that he suffered, having been made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto those who obey him. That's hard for you to think of in your own natural mind. But nevertheless, it's true. Jesus went through these years of preparation to come into the place of being manifested as the Son of God. Okay? It's all those things. Okay? And that we know Jesus was always God from the beginning. Read Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. Always. From eternity. All the way through eternity. Jesus will always be God from there, okay? But there was a point in time when his messianic calling was finally announced on the earth, okay? <clears throat> that you'll find in Luke chapter 3, verse 22, when Jesus was baptized of John in Jordan, and there came a sound from heaven, or a voice from heaven, and said, he said, you are my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now you got to get a hold of the verbiage out of Luke chapter 3 and verse 22 where it says, You, the Father said, You are my beloved Son. He didn't make the announcement to John the Baptist. He made the announcement to Jesus. Think about that. He made the announcement to Jesus. John heard it, but the announcement wasn't to John. The announcement wasn't to people around him. The announcement was to Jesus. You are my beloved son. There's a personal thing there that comes along in our own personal lives when we submit ourselves under the obedience of the Father, the obedience of the Word, and we walk our, in the line that God wants us to walk in. God will personally say to you, you are my beloved daughter in whom I am well pleased. And he did a good job of it too. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So there in the midst of that river, there was an announcement that came. God descended upon him. The Holy Spirit descended upon him. And at that point, the ministry of the Messiah was birthed into the world. Okay? And we talked about last week, we talked a little bit about Esther, and we won't get back into that. How that Esther had been prepared for such a time as this. And I have to say something to you this morning. This church, you as an individual, have been prepared for such a time as this. Yes. As Esther was 10 months out, she was supposed to have been 12, but she found favor with the king and only had to go through 10 months of purifying. I don't know about you, but I'd like it if it was only had to go through a couple of months of purifying. It wouldn't hurt for that. <laughs> Went through that, and she came out, and she came into her position of authority after she had gone through her preparation. Church, if we're going to come to the place of authority, we're going to have to come through the time of preparing before the Lord yes. to be released in that kind of ministry, to be birthed. Amen? Amen? So we have been prepared for such a time as this. For what time? To bring forth the ministry of Christ to this nation and to this, to this county, to this state, to this city. Yes. That's what we've been prepared for. Okay? So we have to be a chaste virgin presented to Christ to be a spouse to him, to be joined to him for that to take place. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 5 and also Genesis chapter 2. Ephesians 5 and Genesis 2. Two ends of the spectrum there. In Ephesians chapter 5, there's quite a, a list of scriptures there talking about relationship between husbands and wives and what they're supposed to do, how they're supposed to submit to one another, pray for one another, uh, uphold one another. And then he relates this relationship of husbands and wives. Remember that Paul said, I espouse you to one husband. Remember that? Okay? So, all the way through Scripture, there's a lot of comparison between a relationship of a husband and wife as to the Lord and to himself. But I think this is really one of the key Scriptures for that. But, <clears throat> let's uh, just read from verse 37. And now let's go to verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify, same word as holy, and cleanse it with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle and any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies, and he that loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, even as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Remember that. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now notice here in verses 30 through 32, it talks about that we are members of his body, we're members of his flesh, and of his what? Bones. And then it says there that this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. And it's a great mystery. Why is it a great mystery? Because... People 
try to understand this with their natural mind. If you try to understand it with your natural mind, you cannot comprehend it. For the scripture declares unto us that things of the spirit cannot be understood by the natural mind, for they are spiritually discerned. So you have to look at things by the mind of the Spirit and by what the Word of God says. You have to compare Scripture with Scripture and grab a hold of what He's trying to say to us. What is He trying to say? It says that Christ and His church are to be one flesh. Now look at Genesis chapter 2. And verse 21. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and took one of his ribs, closed up the flesh thereof, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman, and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now what? Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, and she shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. Have you read that verse anywhere? Just did in Ephesians chapter 5, didn't you? So we see that the marriage of Adam and Eve, where Adam, or where Eve literally emerges out of the substance of Adam. You see that there in, in Genesis? I'm going to say that to you again. The marriage of Adam and Eve, where Eve literally was taken out of or emerged out of the substance of Adam. It's a prophetic picture of the type of the, of the church where we have been taken out of the actual substance of Christ. You've got to grab a hold of that. We're just not a gathering place where we sing songs and, and preach a sermon and have potlucks. We are the church, the body of Christ, and we have emerged out of his very substance. And what God did with Adam and Eve was a prophetic picture, exactly what God did with his church. You've got to grab it. You have got to get a hold of that. And when you do that, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. <laughs> you know. You know. So when he did that, we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, turn with me, you've got to see this. Because if you don't read these scriptures and you just hear what I'm saying, you're going to miss it. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, you've got to see this. So that you understand that you're just not just as person that was born from your mom and dad and one day you came to church and you got saved and your sins are forgiven and your name is written in the Lamb's book of life that's awesome, that's the best thing in the world but there is something bigger that God has for his church to birth the ministry of Christ in the earth look at he, uh, what did I say, 1 Corinthians 6 look at the uh, Verse 15. Know you not. Everybody say I do. <laughs> know you not. That your bodies are the members. Of the assemblies of God. Church of Nazarene. Grants Pass Community Church. No it's not what it says. Your members. Are the what? Your bodies are members of Christ. <clears throat> Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Oh, what did Paul say? That he married you to one husband. God forbid. Verse 16. What? I like that. Know you not... That he which is joined to a harlot is one body. For two saith he shall be one flesh. But he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit. What is he saying? Whatever you join yourself to, you get married to. That's powerful. You become one flesh. 
One. So if you are joined to Christ, you are one with him, you are bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, spirit of his spirit. Are you getting that? Flee fornication. What's he telling you to do? Walk pure. How many of you understand when he's talking about fornication, he's not just dealing with physical fornication, but he's talking about spiritual fornication as well. Every sin that man does is without the body. But he that commits fornication sins against his own body. Why? Because you are one with Christ. You've committed spiritual adultery against Jesus. If I can put it that way. Not a good thing. Verse 19. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Why? Because you're His. Paul said it another way, I am crucified with Christ, yet not I who live, but he that lives in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Amen. So I know it's, you see me, you identify me because you know my name, you know my face, you know my voice. But what I really am is not me. I am his. My body is not mine. I don't get to do with it as I want. And I don't want to do anything to it that desecrates the temple of God. I may not eat all right all the time. I'm guilty of sin like that. And the Lord knows all about it. <laughs> How many of you can say amen to that? Amen. Right? I do that. But purposefully, I am not going to sin against God with my body. Follow that? It's not mine. It's his. My body is married to him. For you are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. We're to glorify him. In every aspect. Every aspect. Okay? We are not, hear me, metaphorically the body of Christ. We are spiritually bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Literally, we are. Genesis 2.23 said that. When they're joined together, they become one flesh. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 30 says that. It is Christ himself in us. And in order for him to come forth through us, we must prepare ourselves for that free flowing of the presence of Christ or the presenting of Christ. Listen, revival comes as Christ prepares for himself a people so that he can be raised up within him. And when that happens, he will draw all men to him. That's when that revival will take place. And we'll start looking like Jesus. Amen? Amen. So he's preparing a way. Let the Lord come to the temple and prepare it. And the Lord has, has presented himself to church ages in Revelation. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with this. But if you read the book of Revelation, just the first three chapters. Chapters 2 and 3 deal with all the different church ages. And it's amazing how the Lord presents himself through each one of those church ages. And he's calling them to separate themselves from all the stuff and just come back to him. And he's bringing and chastening. How many, how many of you understand? Chastening makes you chase. Chastening makes you chase. In other words, when the Lord brings a rebuke to us and wakes us up, it's because he's calling us to that place of purity. 
Listen to these seven churches of things that went on in the book of Revelation. And while we're doing that, just go with me to Revelation chapter 3 because I want you to see this. The first one, and you're just going to go to three and we're going to deal with the last church real quick. But the church of Ephesus, the first thing that they did was they left their first love. They got unmarried. They got divorced. Not a good thing. The church of Smyrna. They said they were Jews, but they weren't. In other words, they lied about who they were. What? <laughs> we don't lie about who we are. You can say you're a Christian, but do we act like a Christian? Are we a Christian? Are we a believer? Are we not? The church of Pergamos. They held the wrong doctrines. Boy, that's kind of familiar for today, isn't it? <laughs> How about the church of Thyatira? They committed spiritual fornication. Church of Sardis. They defiled their garments. In other words, they stopped being a chaste virgin. The church of Philadelphia. Jesus said, just keep on doing what you're doing. You're doing it right. <laughs> I like that church, right? But each time that he brought those rebukes to the church, he says, if you repent quickly, I will put your candlestick back in the holder where it belongs. And he that overcometh shall I give a position to sit with me in my kingdom. So he, each time, it's not because he's mad at them. He's wooing them back to a place of purity and a place of relationship with them. He's trying to get them to be chased again. Uh, a church that is pure before. Then he gets to Laodicea. Boy, do we ever live in the Laodicean age today. But there's some things that went on there. They were lukewarm. We all know that. But I just want you to see a couple of things here. Beginning in verse 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write this. These things saith the Amen, the faithful, the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works. You are neither cold, you're neither hot. I word that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, you're neither cold or hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and know not that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. They were nothing of what they said they were. Now watch what he says to do. I love this. So I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that you may be rich and white raiment, that you may be clothed, and the shame of your nakedness do not appear. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. You know what he's doing? He's loving them back into the kingdom. He said, you said you're this, you say you're this, you say you're that, you say you're this, say you're that. But you're none of those things. You're believing a lie. So he comes to them and he says, I counsel you to become chaste once again. To become pure before me once again. Do you see that? And then he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. I think we need to be zealous in that area. We need to strive for what God has asked. Now watch what happens. Watch what happens. He counsels them to purity. So the entrance of the kingdom of God could come into their midst. Notice what he does in verse 20. After he counsels them then, he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and him with me. And to anyone that overcome will I cause to sit in my throne, even as I overcame and sat down on my father's throne. He that has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Do you notice what he is doing there? And I believe he's doing that even at this very moment with the church. He said, you have thought that this should take place. You think this should be this way. That should be that way. But he says, you know what? None of those things are absolutely true. What you have built is a big facade with all these things that you're doing. 
and you're not exactly what you say you are, but I'm counseling you right now. Tear down those things and rebuild upon the rock who is Jesus the Christ, and when that happens, the gates of hell will not prevail against you. And he says, when you do that, I'm going to be knocking at the door, and if you let me in, I'm going to release kingdom power, kingdom authority amongst you, and you will overcome. Glory to God. That's what he's asking us to do. And how many of you understand when he asks us to do something, he equips you to do it? He never asks you to do one thing that he will not release anointing for you to be able to get it done. So you can rest assured that you're not going to do it in your own strength. You may be, you know, we may be fumbling around a little bit because of some of this is strange ground to a lot of a lot of people. But if you will pray and ask the Holy Spirit of truth, who said he will lead you and guide you into all truth, he'll show you how to get where you need to go. They to be the children of God are led by the Spirit of God. So we can trust Him to lead us in this direction, the road that He is putting us on right now, to move forward, and you're going to see God do some incredible, incredible things. So when you hear this, open the door. Because of Jesus, He's calling right now. <laughs> <laughs> but you notice there that he doesn't come in unless you open the door he doesn't say behold I stand at the door knock open the door and barge in he says that he stands at the door and knocks if any man hear my voice open the door I will come in and it's you and I who have to invite me. I invite you, Heavenly Father, into this ministry and into my life. I invite you, Holy Spirit, to do what you do best in this ministry. That's what we can't do in our own flesh. We invite you, Father, into this valley, into this community into the surrounding area to move powerfully and mightily by your Holy Spirit. Bring and release anointing that will bring many people into the kingdom of God where blind eyes will see and deaf ears will hear. People will get out of wheelchairs. Limbs will grow back just like it was in the day when Jesus walked on the face of the earth when the early church was released in Holy Spirit power on the day of Pentecost and all the way through the book of Acts a resurgence of that that power and that anointing we invite you we hear you knocking on the door we arise and we ask you to come and sup with us Amen. that's the cry of our heart right now that's the cry of our heart right now God I believe is about ready to release heaven's glory and power like we've never seen before. Just trust him and believe him. Trust in him and believe him. You watch what God will do. Heavenly Father, we ask you right now in the mighty name of Jesus to bring revelation to each one of our hearts as individuals even while we sleep in our beds, even while we're working, even while we're walking down the street or shopping or doing whatever that we do, release revelation to each one of our hearts and our minds, showing us where we need to take care of business to allow for an open door of your kingdom power and authority into our lives. Show us the areas that we need to clean up so that there is nothing prohibiting the power of God from flowing in our lives. Father, I know, I know your greatest desire is to see every man, woman, and child come to the foot of the cross of Calvary and be washed in the precious blood of Jesus, to be born again, to have eternal life. 
Father, you have done all you're ever going to do about it. But you left your church in charge to get the job done. So we depend upon you, but we want to be the vessel that is clean in order for that to happen. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, speak to every one of our hearts as individuals and lead us in that way of righteousness and that way of purity. Father, that we will be quick, as the scripture says, to be quick to repent and to be restored. And if that's your desire, shout amen. 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 Hallelujah. I'm expecting. Everybody say, I'm expecting. I'm expecting.